I have this, I felt for some time the Lord had given me this word that I needed to share, and then it started to have two parts that I thought, okay, they're different, but I could see how that might fit together. And then there was a third part that I was like, okay, that's not at all anything. So the, the, the message is going to be called into, not of, which you've heard this kind of expression that we're in the world, but not of the world. And we're going to look at that scripture, and I think it may be a better way we'd say we're called into this world, but we're not of it, you know, or sent into is really the. But the three subjects that I had that felt like the Lord was telling me to speak on, the first one was rest. Um, the second one was kind of our mission as a church. And then the third one was demon possession. And <laughs> the third one was where I started going, you know, that's unusual for a Thanksgiving, a fun-filled Thanksgiving message. And I kind of wrestled with it because I was like, well, surely, God, this is not uh, what you want me to talk about. Um, the week before Thanksgiving, we were supposed to be like, guys, shouldn't we be thankful? And show slides like this that are just, uh, go to my Thanksgiving slide. I have a Thanksgiving. There we go. <laughs> These are the kinds of normal things. So, but as I prayed, finally on Friday, it all clicked together. So what we've got here are three sort of s- s- little pieces that I'm going to hand all of them to you, okay? So it's going to be like piece one, and we're going to do that, and then piece two, and we're going to do that, and then piece three, and you're going to see how they all fit together um, and kind of start to apply to really less Thanksgiving as a holiday, which Thanksgiving is awesome. I think it's probably, um, as a holiday, one of my favorites. And it's Christian in the idea that we should <laughs> we enter his gates with Thanksgiving, you know. I don't think it's Christian in the sense of like, it's not a feast from the Old Testament, you see what I'm saying? But it's a, it's a Christian thing to do. I think it started during the Civil War. Someone can Wikipedia that. But anyway, the idea of being thankful to God is important. However, really what this will tie into is less Thanksgiving, but more this, the season that goes before Christmas, which is Advent, and which is what we're going to start talking about next week. And we're not like all high churchy or anything, but I really felt that the Lord had said to me, you need to do Advent this year. And we've done that in the past, but this is what we're going to be talking about. Normally, we'll kind of pray and say, like, yeah, and I had always thought, because, again, like, not being high churchy and all, that, like, Advent was all about Christmas, you know. And um, it's kind of not. It is, but it's the season that goes before Christmas, and it's about the second coming of Jesus, you know. And I know Jeff's probably watching this going, you knew this. I did know that, but... But the, uh, um, the extent to which that was the case, I didn't know, as I've been reading about it, that, like, we have these, like, oh, we're going to light a candle every week, and the first one's the candle of hope, which is like, well, that's good, and then it's like peace and joy and all this kind of stuff. Well, the original version of it that started in the Middle Ages, the first candle was the candle of, I think, death was the first one. The second one was judgment. The third one was heaven, and the fourth one was hell. Those were the candles that you lit, or, yeah, you lit before Christmas, okay? And what it was supposed to cause people to think about was the condition of humanity without God breaking in, kind of trying to put you in this mindset of how much we need Jesus, okay? So these three things are going to fit together, not really around Thanksgiving, but more around a pre-Advent message, okay? So subject one, rest. This is something that I felt like God started sharing with me. Um, so we're going to call this first part rest or y'all do too much. And by y'all, I mean all of us. This was first something that I felt like the Lord was sharing to me. This scripture reference here is, if you look it up, you'll see, that's just where you find the Ten Commandments. It dawned on me one day, um, since my wife and I, always kind of struggle on the Mary and Martha side of things. We struggle on the Martha side. We kind of get things done. We're going to get things done. You know, I know you think, well, you're a worship leader, so you're a Mary person. I was like, maybe, but I struggle on the work thing. And then we moved here. Like, we live in the, on the property, and it's like, you know, like, when do you not work? And you're like, I don't know. You know, I kind of described it being like a lighthouse keeper. It's like, there's always something to do, you know, and, you know, so you end up kind of like, when do you rest? You're like, yeah, I mean, it happens. And then all of a sudden, I felt this very strong conviction from God because being a person whose mind is about not resting, you can end up justifying all this busyness, okay? And so 
I felt the Lord speak to me very strongly, and he said, you don't rest. This is not a sign of how strong you are. This is a sign of a lack of faith. And I was like, hmm. And this was in prayer. I felt that the Lord said this to me. And so I started thinking about that, and then I felt led to um, go look at the Ten Commandments because I felt like God was, he's like, I gave a list of Ten Commandments. There's ten of them, and I'll give you some of the short stuff at the end where it says, you shall not murder. That's one of them. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. So the first four you see here, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. We talked about this just recently. So this is God talking about himself. He's like, let me set some things straight. I am the guy who took you out of Egypt, and you're not going to have any other gods before me. That's number one. You shall not make yourself an image of anything on heaven. So he's like saying, don't make any idols. That's number two. Then he's like, you shall not misuse my name. So you've got several here in a, in a row about God himself. He's like, let me just make a few things clear first off. I'm going to talk about me, you know. Then he moves on to stuff for us, you know. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And then it keeps on going, like, there's like a whole paragraph of like, this is what I mean by that. And what God, I felt like what he was saying, he's like, this is not like because you just need it. This is what I want. And then, like I said, it's la- listed right alongside honoring your father and mother. And then you shall not murder. That was the one that really got me. I felt like I was like, you know, if I'm going to make a list of how to live, and one of them is don't murder people, which we would all agree, I think, is a good rule, that on par with that... God's like, you need to keep the Sabbath day holy. And I think that just because I'm a 21st century American person, that maybe that one I could skip. But if you said, well, I want to just start murdering people, you might be like, you know, I have a problem with you being a pastor who thinks you can just murder people or commit adultery or just steal, you know? So I was like, you have to really start to see this in in the context of that's how God feels about it. And the other ones are all about him. Like, you know, don't mess with that. You see what I'm saying? So... as I was thinking this, I was like, gosh, Lord, you know, that this is a big deal to you, and it's not a big deal to me. I'm probably the one who's wrong in that equation. That's just a little tidbit. That's pastoral tidbit for the rest of you. <laughs> if you run into something that you think that God doesn't or God thinks that you don't, you're the one who's wrong. But the, uh, I was thinking this, and then I was like, okay, I'll start doing this. And I found it really hard, okay? Because, like, like, okay, we're almost going to do this, and then it would, eh, you know, and then if you've been in one of our house churches this fall, most of, these, most of our groups have been going through a book called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And all of a sudden, we ran into So I was already dealing with this with God or God was dealing with me. I already, then I ran into this chapter. The whole chapter is about Sabbath. The premise of this book, just so you know, because you can pick it up and read it on your own time. And you might find it both at the same time kind of uh, sim- simple in the way he approaches things and extremely, like, revealing. You know, like my wife and I, who I would consider ourselves, you know, pastorally advanced, I guess. I mean, it's kind of what we do. You think, we've probably sorted through marriage things pretty good. You know, and then all of a sudden we're reading this book, and it's really simple. And he's not even saying anything you haven't, like, you could probably write the book yourself. You see what I'm saying? And then I go, oh, crap. Like, I mean, like, this is not working at all. Like, this, that's exactly what we do the whole time. And I'm like, why are we not seeing this? And then, you know, so this is kind of how this book is. (laughs) And so when he started talking about Sabbath, I was like, well, here we are. I was already primed for this. Like, what you got? So, the book's called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. The premise is you can't, be emotion, you can't be spiritually deep and emotionally unhealthy. Those two things, they're not exactly synonyms, but they're so close they don't, they don't exist in a separate state. So if you think, I'm spiritually deep, but I hate all these people, you're not. And this book will help you figure that out. I mean, and it's not like a judgment. It's just this is how we are. Like, we can get in communities where you think you can do that. This guy who wrote it was in one, and then he realized, oh, I'm not, when his wife said, I want to go to a different church. But <laughs> you should read it. It's interesting. But he talks about how our culture and how Israelites were in, the, when they get this instruction, they'd been in bondage for 400 years as slaves with no time off ever. And then all of a sudden, God's giving them a list of things, how I want you to live. And a lot of these things are specifically worded to say, like, you're not Egyptian anymore. Like, you're not there anymore. Like, I'm God, not then. I'm this, not that. You know, and we talked about how immediately he comes down and there's a golden calf, which was something they worshipped in Egypt and all that kind of stuff. Like they were, he's saying these things on purpose. And then right in the middle of that, he's like, remember my Sabbath day and keep it holy. 
So if you were a person who's not had any rest for 400 years, or like my friend over here has been in ministry for many, 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 many years, <laughs> to hear God's, one of his main instructions is you need to rest on a day because I think it's a big deal. That would ring a certain way in your ears. And it also is a sign of Israel's liberation from, um, from Egypt. And, and then it's God who did it. It reminds us we are more than what we do. And we are not loved because of what we do. I'm just kind of skimming through some of the notes from that book. And then he has a quote from Eugene Peterson, who's the person who's written the other book that we're reading this month. Sabbath is not primarily about us or how it benefits us. It is about God and how God forms us. I do not see any way out of it. If we're going to live appropriately in the creation, we must keep Sabbath. Okay? I meant to make a slide for this, but he gave four principles of things you can do. Let's make it a little practical. I do not have this on a slide, so you're just going to have to write these down. He recommends that you stop. That's number one. Plan, stop. You have to actually try. You have to plan this. Like, stop doing things on this Sabbath day. It... Um, which is hard because you're not going to be done with everything, but you still have to say, I'm going to stop. And it reminds you that you're not God. Like, the world's not going to fall apart if you take a day off, you know. That's a hard one for a lot of us, but it's true. Um, and it's important that this happens on a weekly basis so that you get reminded of that on a weekly basis because a lot of us start to slowly creep into thinking we're God again. So one is stop. Two is rest, which means do the things that delight you. Whatever, you know, delights you and replenishes you is how he describes that. Three is delight, which means focus on good things. And he talked about in the book how he remembers when he was starting to celebrate Sabbath, he actually went into a McDonald's and was washing his hands, and it was a cold day, and he remembers thinking the warm water on his hands was such a blessing. And he was like, I wouldn't have noticed this before, <laughs> you know, but he was like, you know, warm McDonald's water. And then four is contemplate, which means fo contemplating God in our lives and all this kind of thing. So the thing is, well, I said rest Y'all do too much. Part of what we need to do is do less. But while we're doing less, we need to prioritize the right things. And y'all already know this, so I'm not going to have to beat this horse or anything. So I want to say that I believe as the pastor of this church to this community that this is something God is saying to all of us. We need to rest, and it's right to rest. And doing more stuff so you seem more spiritual is wrong. Is that an okay word to do? It's wrong. You're not proving anything to anybody. You're just stressing everybody out. We all need to rest. And God has put this in one of the Ten Commandments, so it's a big deal. That's point one. Point two, mission. This is where we get this sub, the title for this message, Into Not Of. I'm going to read this scripture, John 17, 14 through 19. This is Jesus talking. If it's in your Bible and they do this, it's red words. He's talking about his disciples. My Bible had a heading, Jesus prays for his disciples, okay? And that's including us, okay? I have given them your word. And the world has hated them, for they are not of the world anymore, any more than I am of the world. Like, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world, implying you're not, okay? My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. I need to read that again. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I. I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Here's the thing. As you sent me into the world, he's praying to God. Okay, this is Jesus talking. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them, I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. Okay? Write this down, John 17, 14 through 19. It's part of a bigger thing. This is us as Christian people following Jesus today as well as then when he was praying for the few disciples he had at that time. We're now part of that group, okay? There is a tendency among us to, when we have an encounter with Jesus and he transforms our lives, to want to run away from the world, okay? And if the disciples did that, none of us would be here right now. And when I say be here, I mean have salvation as something that's been given to us, okay? We cannot, as Christian people, live a life that's running away from the world. Jesus is sending us into the world, but we're not of it. So there's a couple things about that. We should know at a core of who we are that we are sent 
into this world. And it's into this world, okay? That's all of it. You might be a particular part of it. Your particular part might be really annoying. Like, I get it. You know what I mean? But you're sent, just like I'm sent. We're all sent. Nobody's not sent. Jesus says you're sent, just like he's sent. It's an honor to be sent. We're sent. We're not running away. We're not hiding. We're not building a little bubble for ourselves where we can control everything and everything is safe. That's not the attitude. We're sent into the world, okay? But we're not of the world. So when they act like they are, we shouldn't be shocked, okay? This is hard. I'm not saying this like, since I got this all figured out, you know. One of the things is that rest is important so that you have capacity to do this stuff, okay? If you notice, Jesus is on this mission. There's a lot of times when it's like, and the crowd formed, and Jesus went away from the crowd to pray by himself. You see, you need even Jesus. God rested on the seventh day in, in Genesis. So it's not, this is not just like a thing for you weak people. You see what I'm saying? This is an important part of God's created order that he himself does, both as God and as Jesus. And so this necessary capacity for us to be able to be in the world and not of the world is incredibly difficult, and you need capacity for that. The Holy Spirit empowers you. It's not just something you do out of your own strength, but it's important. Because when you see in Matthew 28, which this is a great commission. I'll just read it. I don't have a slide for it, but I'll read it. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded, I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is Jesus' great commission to all of us. We all have a part to play in that. Every single one of us that's following Jesus has a part to play in this great commission. Nobody's just watching. Okay? So we're not called to run away. We're called to run into this world. And it's, and it's like Jesus. This is what Jesus has done, and he's modeled it for us, and uh, he's praying here for us. My prayer is not that you take them out of this world, but that you protect them from the evil one. So a lot of that thing that makes us want to create that protective bubble for ourselves, he gets. So it's not like saying, like, oh, my gosh, guys, come on. You know, he gets it because there's an evil one, and he wants you to be protected from it. But he is praying for you to be protected from it. We need to have the boldness to go, okay? This is where we're going to change to the third part of demon possession, which is where this starts to come together. I just didn't see it. So maybe you'll see it immediately. You're like, oh, I get where he's going. And I, I didn't because I was like, well, this is weird. One of the biggest things we're going to talk about in Advent, or it's a thing, it's a theme you need to know, uh, is that three actors on this biblical stage, a lot of people like to talk about two. Three, God, humans, a lot of people are comfortable with that. And then they'll try to rope in the third one, which Advent types to separate the enemy, or the devil, or Satan, or, you know, there's a lot of different names the Bible uses for it. Those three actors are involved in the biblical story. It's not just two. The devil doesn't just get absorbed into bad humanity. You see what I'm saying? These are actors. Like, they're doing things, you know? Consciousness. There's things like this to say about it. But it's also kind of beyond our language. It's a little hard to get at. So I'm going to talk about this story. If some of you have already turned to it, it's in um, where is it? Mark 5, 1 through 20. This is a story. Um, it's in parallel scriptures too, I think. There, Jesus is crossing um, on a boat, and then he gets to, uh, to an area, and he runs into a demon-possessed man. And I think, I just want to say, because the way we're going to talk about this and apply it to ourselves is kind of using it... Um, as a picture about the two things I just talked about, okay? So I want to say before all that, I believe this is an event that happened. I think Jesus did this, okay? So and so if that's a stretch for you, we could talk about it, okay? I get that. Like, our culture doesn't have a grid for demon possession, except for, like, in movies where we know it's fake, you know? But, like, if, we, if we're going to take on this biblical worldview that there's God, there are humans, and there is an evil presence, the, the, you know, 
an active evil presence, you're going to have to start to realize that some of the stuff, this isn't like, well, you know, that guy was probably just schizophrenic or something like that. I don't think that's the best way to read this. Though I do think that there are probably times when people in the world even now suffer from mental illness and people think it's from a spiritual source and it probably isn't sometimes, you know. Though I think in this story it's included in a certain way that in at a certain time in this this gospel. See, it's interesting. Gospel is the story of Jesus. This is the gospel according to Mark, okay? The gospel, the story of Jesus. So it was written on purpose a certain way. And nobody has quite yet figured out who Jesus is. You know, we know. You see what I'm saying? You're like, well, you know, and you can kind of forget that maybe they didn't. In that gospel, no one had said who Jesus is yet. So the first person who, like, kind of correctly picks up on who Jesus is in the sense of, like, you know, whoa, you know, like, he hasn't had that whole thing with Peter yet about, like, who do you say I am? You know, this whole bit, you know? It's this, uh, there's a demon. So schizophrenic people that are suffering mentally don't know things like that. You see what I'm saying? That's why I think that one piece of information is really important, which if you're only in mental illness, you need to back up a little that there could be evil moving here. I believe there was. But we're going to look at this story and take from it the pictures and look at them in our own lives and then see how this all fits together, which I know is a little strange, but just bear with me. I'm going to read the whole thing. Um, They went across the lake to the region of the Gerizims. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. The man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, and he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs and allow us to come into them. And he he gave them permission. This is strange. (laughs) And the impure spirits came out And went into the pigs, and the herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed, and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people that what had happened to the demon-possessed man, and, and they told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged him to go with them. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So that man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis, which was like several cities together, kind of, how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. So you have a demon correctly identifying Jesus as the Son of God. This is so that we're already into a weird territory here. But um, what I want us to do is, like I said, I believe this happened. So let's just establish that. But it's been included in the story to kind of tell about who Jesus is and make a point for us that we can then hold on to and use. So I want us to use that kind of secondary spot. That's how I want us to see that this man is possessed by demons, okay? And I think evil lurks about in all sorts of ways. And I, I think G.K. Chesterton in his book, Orthodoxy, talks about that, like, original sin is the only thing that we actually have proof of. He's like, I don't know why people struggle with that so much because it's, like, it's not too hard to come up with examples of sin. You know what I mean? And uh, so evil lurking about in this world and wreaking havoc in our lives, start to hear this description less literally, not less, because like, I think this is literal, but it's also more than just literal. Do you hear what I mean by that? Not less than literal. Like, this, is, this didn't really happen, but it sounds good. You know, it's like the Lord of the Rings, and it's kind of poetic and interesting that way. This is not like, I think this is a true story, but you can see in this how this reaches into deeper things that go beyond just being literally true into eternal things. 
Am I, does that make sense what I'm saying? So, like, for example, a man with an impure spirit. Okay. So back up just a little bit and start to think about our lives and when we start to live under the influence of that evil, okay? Don't have to be fully demon-possessed in that sort of, but under the, you know, when we're doing things that we shouldn't be doing or living in ways we shouldn't be living, okay? You following me now? Where did he come from? Came from the tombs to meet him. The guy lives alive in the tombs. This is what your life starts to look like. It, this is what your life looks like without Jesus is what it really is. And even those of us that are saved can choose to kind of go back to these tombs. You know what I mean? We find ourselves under the influence of this evil. The man lives in tombs. No one could bind him anymore, not even with chains, because he had been chained by foot and he tore the chains apart. That the world might even try to, like, deal with our problems, but they don't work. They can't even contain the problems. Their answers don't work anymore. It's not really an answer. It's just trying to limit the problem from hurting us. You know, we're going to... That doesn't mean that they're necessarily ill-meaning. Ill like, they're, we don't know what to do, but we know that you're violent, so we're going to stop this with the means we have at our disposal to help you with your problems, you see? But, you're, the, but the evil is breaking the, the... It doesn't work. It doesn't do anything. So... The life led by evil is living among the dead. That's not even living. So you're kind of alive dead, okay? Y'all are following me now, right? And then the world's going to go, well, we don't know what to do with this guy. Let's bind him up with the things we have to work with. And they don't. Able to break free, okay? No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs in the hills, he would cry out. So this evil life, this evil thing, which is now controlling you, leads you to, des like, people try to help. They can't help because they don't have anything to offer, really, even though they want to help. You're scaring people, crying out. It's con it, that thing is making you cry out day and night and cutting himself with stones. So now you're hurting yourself. This thing is making you hurt yourself. But then he saw Jesus. Now keep in mind, this evil influence, as literal as it can be, a legion of demons living in, inside someone, okay? And as poetic as I'm talking about, which is maybe we're more comfortable with, it's kind of the same thing, so it doesn't bother me. You know what I mean? <laughs> that thing is afraid of Jesus. That guy isn't. But we're stuck confused now. When he comes up, there's a man, and he's kneeling before Jesus. And he's talking, but he's not the one talking. Because Jesus asks him his name. And he says, hey, what's your name? The demon tells him his name. So that demon's got so much control over him now, he can't even talk anymore. The demon makes him go before Jesus and he's like, hey, you know, we just sang, I bow down to the Holy One. This is the same thing this guy is doing, you know. The reaction is actually correct. So he bows down before Jesus. They have this whole exchange, the whole pig thing. It's really interesting. And then Jesus is the only solution to this thing. This is really what I want to get to. Without Jesus... Guys, guys, done. You know what I mean? That's all of us, okay? That's the world without Jesus. It's like this guy. And the less we rely on Jesus, our lives look like this guy too. You know what I mean? And so without Jesus, you got no hope. There isn't any hope. You're living in the tombs, okay? But with Jesus, like, not only is it like... uh this guy's just more powerful, so it works out. You know what I mean? Which would be good enough, okay? Like, if you're like, hey, we got the winning team, we're good, you know? But it's so imbalanced that the guy's like, please don't torture me. See what I'm saying? Like, he knows he can't even fight. He's done. I'm not going to say, because we don't know what that guy thought. 
who's stuck in this whole three-part fight. You see what I'm saying? Because if it was just him, I don't know. But there's the devil and the enemy in this three-part thing, and we get stuck in it sometimes. So it might be that that guy's also afraid of Jesus at this moment, or it might be that he's begging, please, save me. Just like you see these other people that get healed by Jesus, like, hey, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I kind of think he'd probably be like that, because even those that are of us that have suffered from the worst kind of demons, you know, and addictions and all kinds of things, deep down inside, you want to be free from that thing. You know what I mean? Well, Jesus is the only one who can set you free. So he runs to Jesus afraid. And, the, and so he, anyway, the, the whole pig thing happens and the demons are gone, which is kind of like, all right, big deal. This is great. So this, what's the reaction? This is where we need to start looking. People came and saw the guy in his right mind. Okay. I would think, I'd be like, look at this, you know, like, all right, you know, that's awesome, you know, for so many years, you know, all this stuff you've done, you know, all this pain you've caused, it's gone, you know, that's not how they feel, (laughs) they see him sitting at peace, finally at peace, they see him dressed, finally dressed like they are, I think he's normal again. And in his right mind. And their response is to ask Jesus to leave. Like, can you please leave? You know. When Jesus is, um, we can pasteurize the ministry of Jesus to think that we would always get it or always like it or always understand it or that it's simple. We just all feel good, you know. And at the end of the day, you do, but in the moment, when you see God really change somebody, like I said, we're using this poetically. So, oftentimes, we can find ourselves like these guys who, when we see God setting somebody free, we have to be very careful that we don't get start sending Jesus away. You see what I'm saying? Like, I don't want to be around that, you know. Because I'm going to get extra biblical here to try to help you understand this, is that you've had to live with this guy. Well, it's nice for Jesus who shows up. He had dealt with him for five minutes. And then there's this pig thing, and it's great. We've been living here for 30 years. And this guy's, uh, I mean, start on the soft side, a total jerk. He's the meanest person I've ever met. How's Jesus even being nice to this guy? Maybe you think he deserves to live in the tombs because he's such a jerk. Or, get way worse, maybe he's done bad things to you because of the demons. You might not see Jesus coming and setting him free as justice, kind of making wrong things right that Jesus, the good judge, does. Because it might be personal to you. I don't know, you're going to have to pray and think on that. But people were amazed. But then Jesus is like, we got to go. we got things to do. And he's like, let me come with you, man. <laughs> like, I don't want to go back to this whole thing. And Jesus is like, i got something else for you to do. You need to go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how much he's had mercy on you. And this is how all these things fit together. Our rest is reminding us that we're not God. That's probably the most important thing. We're not God. We're never going to be. And that original sin finds its way right up into this thing. You know, I got to manage, I got to take care of things, you know. And I'll be admit, I'm the chief among sinners on this one, you know. This is why I think it's the biggest deal that I'm the person up here sharing about it. I'm like, look, this is not something I've got down. But I'm intentionally in front of all of you who declare I'm working on it because it's this important. The second thing is that we're sent into this world just like Jesus is. He says, like I am. So what does that look like? In this situation, what did Jesus do? He's the one. He's the only one who can set the person free. He's the only one. And he does. And he will. And he does among us. Even now, to the most literal demon-possessed, 
and all the way back to those of us that are just struggling, if you, fo- you know, you get what I mean. And just like he said, like you sent me, I send them. He sends this guy. Go home to your own people. And tell them how much the Lord has done for you. But the last piece here. And how he has had mercy on you. Hey, Jonathan, come on up here. Let me just play something. We call it sweet nothings when you play in the background while we talk. The, uh, that's a little insider info for you guys. <laughs> sweet nothings. But the, uh, this idea that if you go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how much he's had mercy on you, when you see him putting that phrase with this into the world, not of the world thing, you start to get a picture of what it means to share your faith with somebody. Because how much did the demon-possessed guy do to get free? Not very much. Nothing. That's the right word. Not a dang thing. All right? That's the same thing for you guys and the same thing for me. Jesus is the one setting us free. And he says, what did he do? He had mercy on me. And he had mercy on you. And he's sending you into the world. Not to hide and get in your little club where you can control everything and everything's safe. He's sending you into the world. And you don't have to win a debate with everyone. You don't have to be right all the time. You're just not. None of us are. And it actually doesn't matter if you can remember that like this guy who's been set free, you're left with this. Tell them how much the Lord has done for you. Has he ever done anything for you? Start there. (laughs) And how much he's had mercy on you. Mercy is what God is doing here because we can start to think if we don't rest properly that we're kind of more like God than not. And if we forget how he came into this world and how he's sending us, we could start to slowly build a Christian world, and a lot of us do, that forgets the mercy he's had on us. And we start to think that we kind of earned it or we kind of deserve it. Well, God should save me, but, I mean, you know, come on, you know. So I want us... (laughs) I want us to, as we move into Christmas, and more specifically Advent next week, to remember that you're basically a demon-possessed guy who lives in the tombs and hurts people and hurts themselves and cuts themselves and can't really do anything good except for Jesus having mercy on you. And when Jesus has mercy on you, they can change every single thing. And when he does, it's, it's amazing. It is, but sometimes it scares people because it's real. We're not talking about feel-good stuff, you know. And then everybody hugged and it was all great, you know. Sometimes it doesn't end that way. And when Jesus says, I sent you into this world, when he came into this world, and the scripture we're going to look at next week talks about how the world feels towards people that know this. It hates them. And I'm not trying to say this stuff to be like, well, let's be all serious all the time. I'm, I'm just trying to be for real. You know, the world that we're not of anymore hates this kind of freedom. It's scared of it. It wants Jesus to leave. And so it's going to take us a season. And they call it Advent in the church to really reflect on these things. And we don't want to rush through them. And we are going to, you know, <laughs> I struggled with the, the scripture readings it's funny because I felt the Lord was like, do Advent. I'm like, well, that'll be easy, you know? And they, and like the church, like like I said, we're not all old high churchy and everything, but there's like scripture readings. And so you're going to grab them and you go, yeah, we'll preach on that. And then I had kind of thought in the more hope, peace, joy, candle thing, you know, that like, this will be great. We'll talk about the angels saw, you know, the shepherds saw the angels and Jesus is great, you know. And when you look at the scriptures, even how they've come through this pasteurized stuff in these more liberal mainline churches or whatever, you know, they still retain the first scripture we're reading is Luke 21, which is a parallel of Matthew 24, which is (laughs) intense. And then it's all about John the Baptist. 
This is the real world that we live in, and we need to kind of wake up to that. So it's going to be a season. It's not going to be all in one moment. But I do want to say this. Remember this rest this week. It's not going to just happen. You need to try to rest and not just do things. Um, we need to find some boundaries, not just do things out of guilt and out of, you know, pressure and all these sorts of things. I need... and then move into these other things, you know. But if you need, if you feel particularly connected as we're talking about demon possession at whatever level, okay? <laughs> if you need to come and kneel before the Lord, and I'm going to do it, so I don't feel like this is like a, ooh, look at him. You know, he thinks he's demon possessed. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm, I'm going to kneel before the Lord. There's things we need to leave. In the first part, we do too much. Some of this is the burdens we're carrying and the demons we're carrying. And some of us, we just need to say, Jesus, have mercy on me. And so I'm going to pray. And if you need to come forward, spend some time at the altar to set our hearts right before this season. And Jonathan is going to close in a song. So, Father, I pray. I know this message has been um, something that you have given me to say. Um, and I pray that we have heard it. And I pray that even if I didn't say it right, that people would hear what you want them to hear. Um, speak in spite of my limitations, Lord. And I pray that uh, you would let us i pray that we would hear your instruction to go amongst our people and tell them of the good things you've done for us and the mercy you've had on us and god let us be people who are freed from the demons in jesus name amen so if you need to come forward and pray please do